Welcome back to what is now firmly called the Delling Pod. Because now joining us is my special Scottish friend. My special Scottish friend, Michael Woodley, um, who I'm delighted to discover my special Scottish friend, because I, d- I, d- I didn't know he existed, and now I do. Um, he has given the nod to the Delling Pod, and, and so the name is Stark. And Ed is still with us. And um, I think we're going to talk about your book, this this amazing book that you've both written, which I think is going to... I'm bound to get into trouble, aren't I, but by, by promoting it, just because the left is increasingly resistant to the kind of thesis that you are promoting in the book, which is what, basically? Tell me. Well, the basis of the book is the idea that many trends in Western civilization at the moment can be accounted for via a fairly simple regularity, and that is the decrease in the population's average level of general intelligence due to there being uh, a distinct fertility advantage to having low as opposed to high levels of general intelligence on average. Basically, you're saying we're getting thicker. Yes. And, and we should worry about this. But you start off with the most... Uh, you're straight in there, actually. I mean, one of the things I love about your book, it takes no prisoners. And I like books that take no prisoners. It's, it's, very, it's very unapologetic in what it says about the world. And you start off with this brilliant, brilliant example, which I, if, you can, if you can condense it, that would be good. The story about, about Concord... Yes, I mean, it, it's, it, it's quite a simple phenomenon, really. We, Concord was developed, some of the world's brightest mind. There was a, a desire to get from New York, London to New York, quicker. It's, be, it's good for trade, it's good for everything, we need to do it quickly. Some of our brightest minds got together and they came up with the idea of Concord. And Concord was in the skies and everything went well and everything was fine. I mean, there were occasional mistakes, but they were always corrected in time by the pilots or whatever. And then one day, in the year 2000, um, a a sufficiently bad mistake was made, which was that an Airbus, which was before Concorde, on the same runway, a few minutes, was badly repaired by a jagged bit of metal. It fell off. Concorde uh, drove over that bit of of metal. It was committed to take off. It had to take off. It burst its tyre, burst the fuel tank open, fire. Concorde crashed, and and, and people were killed. And what it was down to was incompetence. What it was down to was basically stupidity um, and a lack of forward thinking, basically insufficient intelligence. And, and as a consequence of that, we went backwards. We used to be able to, when I was a boy, you'd hear Concord flying over, you'd hear the, the boom. You would. And, and you got used to it, I kind of miss it now. And, and the reason that we, we don't have it anymore is potentially because we no longer have enough intelligence to be able to keep Concord in the sky. Because if, because if intelligence is going down, then we can think of it almost as sort of, like a, 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 sort of a, a pyramid. And each, each layer, each layer of that is reducing in size. So it, it, a system of over-promotion. The pilots of the 1980s would have been something higher now, and it's people that were something lower down the scale that are now pilots. Every level is over-promoted, and my... Yes? Yes, we have this term, upward social mobility, and it's a sort of buzzword, but has a lot of political capital, so people talk about social mobility. What they generally mean is upwards mobility. The interesting thing is if you have a situation in which general intelligence is declining, what this in essence means is that, as to elaborate on on Dr. Dutton's analogy, those at the top of this pyramid who have the highest levels of this ability are boiling off. And what happens is the bar gets lowered because in order to replace or replenish the elite faction, because the elite faction is not reproducing, you have to select increasingly from among those of lower average ability, which means the bar gets lowered. So it's not so much people are going up, it's that the bar is going down with every consecutive generation. So the people in the aircraft industry now, you're saying, are are notably thicker than the people who were working in in, in 1969 when, when Concorde appeared, is that...? Yes, historically these would have been sort of second or third tier mines, essentially. Now that the first tier mines have essentially failed to reproduce themselves, the uh, 
the, the bar has lowered and the second and third tier mines are now occupying the elite positions formerly occupied by the first tier mines. what you get mines. at the very bottom of the pyramid, therefore, is somebody that makes this short-term bad decision with this jagged bit of metal that's not the right fit and it's put on the back of the Airbus to fall off and cause all this. And that's what intelligence decline becomes about. It becomes about lots of little minor things on an everyday basis which yeah. will build up to make life worse Worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Lots of little impulsive, ill-thought-out decisions. I think there's a, more, there's a more profound point as well. That's If you look at Concorde, just as an example of a technology, yeah. Concorde was designed to solve a very complex problem, <coughs> and that is the movement of people at very high speed from one side of the Atlantic to the other and beyond. As originally, Concorde was designed to fly all sorts of routes, but geopolitics meant it was restricted to a very few, mostly the transatlantic run. But getting people from A to B very quickly is a complex problem. It requires considerable investments of the expertise in devising all sorts of engineering problems to overcome issues like uh, air resistance at very high velocity. You need special alloys, you need special engines, you need special fuels, etc. You need a completely redesigned airframe, one with a delta wing instead of normal wings and a tailplane. And Concorde arose from this highly creative process of problem solving, complex problem solving. And what's, what's notable about the Concorde phenomenon and other phenomena related to this, such as the space Side yeah, the, mo the moon the landings. Shots, exactly. Is these incredibly complex and intricate pieces of technology are not being replaced with better technologies, nor are they being replaced with technologies that have the same level of complexity and sophistication. And bearing in mind these technologies are now 50 years old in some instances. Yeah. They're being replaced with what are in some respects better technologies, such as composite materials for building lightweight fuselages, fuel e economizing engines, but in many other respects are regressive technologies in the sense that the airframes used today, yeah. such as the Airbus, those designs have been around really since the days of the de Havilland Comet in the 1940s. We have not made much progress in terms of radical redesign of airframes since the 1940s and 1950s. Right. But the fact that there are, there are more of us, I, I don't know how much the population, the planet's population has increased since, since the late 60s, but, but it must have put on a, a billion at least. Um, mm. Doesn't that counter to a degree? The, uh, 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 isn't that extra billion going to produce enough, enough sort of um, super geniuses to, to, to create all these amazing things that in the past were handled by a, a few people in the Industrial Revolution? Well, no. I mean, f first of all, the, the, the research that uh, Dr. Woodley has, has, has done, on my, my colleague has done on this, is showing that it is, it is a per capita issue. So he looks at per right. capita major innovations over time, and it's demonstrated that they peak in about 1850. These are innovations that are recognized by uh, uh, convergent, by, by oh, other right. being major innovations, and they peak circa 1850, something like that, uh, and then they start to go down. Um, and the second thing is that um, what the idea that the population increasing will, will, will make up for it assumes that the population is get, that's increasing is roughly the same as the population that was already there. But if the, intellectually, I mean, right. but if the population is less intelligent and indeed is significantly less intelligent than the, than the population in the 60s, um, then of course it's just, um, it, it, it's just making things much, much worse. Right. Um, and, and, it, and it's less likely to produce geniuses. And it's likely to make uh, society, the environmental aspects of producing geniuses, more difficult as well. Um, but so, because the education system will get worse, for example, because people are less intelligent. So on every, it's, it's just not accurate. What's going on is we are innovating less. Before, before we move on, to I, I want to backtrack in a moment so we can go in more detail uh, as to how your thesis works and about how things used to work in up, t up till the early modern period and how things have changed now. But <coughs> briefly, talking about Concorde and the moon landings, I like your thesis about that the reason we, we don't have Concorde anymore is because we're all too thick. But isn't part of it, do you think, do you think the green, green group think has anything to do with it? In, in as much as nowadays we're not, cons as a society, as a culture, certainly in the West, we're not concerned with getting a t from A to B as quickly as possible as we are in 
reducing our carbon footprint. I mean, this, 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 this idea has taken hold of the industry. And I wonder, to, to tie it in with your book, whether, whether green groupthink isn't in itself a manifestation of the drop in, in intelligence, the fact that, that supposedly educated, universally educated people buy into this bullshit. Where, it, where do we go on that one? It's a very interesting point. Um, I'd say there is an issue with groupthink, and I agree with you that groupthink particularly at the level of bureaucratization, is a probable manifestation of these trends in so much as people of lower average ability yep. tend not to be the sort of people who strike out in a highly innovative and creative way. There's more, there's more to sort of innovation and creativity than simple intelligence. You need a certain kind of personality. You need a, you need a very risk taking personality, you need a sort of someone who's willing to defy social convention or local... Churchillian indeed. Churchillian, Churchillian yes. indeed. Yeah. You need a sort of Churchillian type character, you need someone who's willing to sort of stand up against the tide of, of whatever it is that is, mo you know, that is operating, that is modal at the time, and to move, try to move things in a different direction. So in a sense, genius combines other traits that might in combination relate to leadership. They tend to be first movers. If you take if you reduce IQ, you necessarily reduce the frequency of these, these sort of genius type people because yeah. IQ is one necessary but not sufficient component. And what this leaves you with is a sort of committee-based problem-solving mentality, which you find permeating academia, you find it permeating decision-making in governments, you see it, you see it at all, all levels of social organization. And it's related to the proliferation of bureaucracy. And an interesting, there's interesting studies showing that scientific discoveries, Nobel Prize winners, for example, are getting older. So one of the few sort of regularities across time, if you look at Nobel Prize winners, is that they seem to be getting older and older and older, which is consistent with the idea that they're, they're less, they're the spring chicken phenomenon. They're less sort of young, adventurous, risk-taking type people. They're more, they're more sort of older, established career They've done academics. their time. They've paid their dues. Exactly. And what's more is, is often the discoveries that they make are made as a function of large teams that they've managed. So in essence, they're getting the, a lot of these people, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of these people seem to be getting Nobel Prizes, not so much for their breathtakingly brilliant innovations, but more for their ability to manage vast teams of scientists. So they're super bureaucrats, basically. Super bureaucrats, exactly. And that, that is definitely, I think, an outcome of this decrease in general intelligence and this waning of, of this, this sort of genius type phenomenon that was much more prevalent in our intellectual landscape. Geniuses have historically. been essentially thrown out of the universities because what mm. what a genius, as, as Dr. Woodley said, what a, ge what a genius is about is outlier high intelligence plus to a certain degree sort of moderately low agreeableness, mm. moderately low conscientiousness, right? Which right. means that they care if they offend people and they can think outside the box and they're highly intelligent. Now, in the old in the 50s or something like that, they, they would get these people at universities, they would give them a salary, they don't need much, they just need nothing. They're not, they're not particularly materialistic people, you know. Yeah. Um, and they just say, okay, bugger off and, 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 and and you know, here's some teaching to do, and here's lots of free time, and hopefully you come up with something fantastic. And that's why they had time to do things like invent languages and write novels and and, 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 and all this sort of thing. But some of them came up with some genuinely brilliant and, 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 and important things. Now, doing well in academia is about regularly publishing, which of course they're not interested in doing because they want to work on a project for years and years and years and years until they solve their given obsessive problem. Um, it's you've got to regularly publish, you've got to go to conferences, which these people tend to be kind of misanthropes and they social, they can't stand going to conferences, yeah. that drives them mad. Um, they, 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 they have to be able to deal with bureaucracy and stuff like that. that, they can't deal with that. They have to be socially skilled, I mean in an era of political correctness you've got to be careful what, they, what you say, yeah. and they're, they're not good at that. Um, so on every level it therefore means that it, there are less likely to be geniuses getting the coaching by society they need, if you like, to push them to their maximum level such that they can make um, discoveries. So that's another problem that bureaucracy is causing uh, universities. So let's go back to the beginning about how things were <coughs> pre-1850. Mm. We were selectively breeding for more intelligent people, weren't in, we, as in a, culturally? We so I, I, explain how that works. Well, what essentially happened was you, you had a situation in which various factors in the environment, such as uh, unpredictable climate, uh, so high variability in climate, would impose what's called extrinsic morbidity on populations. And what that essentially means is this is population you can't control. Sorry, mor mortality, rather, you cannot control. 
So if it's extrinsic, it means it's essentially beyond your control. Yeah. And uh, the people who were most likely to die as a result of some sudden climatic shift or some social instability or a famine or some other disaster, essentially, were people with lower ability and higher time preferences. So these would be people who didn't necessarily anticipate the future yes. and were therefore not able to prepare for the future, which is a trait which in part draws on intelligence. But what we know, looking back, there's a chap called Gregory Clark, who was a professor of economic history at uh, UC Davis, who has made probably the best study on, uh, conducted the best study uh, uh, on, on this particular topic, and he's looked at the prevalence of surnames over time. So he's looked at elite surnames in England, so yeah. these Hibernio-Norman names, um, ending in Ville, that sort of thing, back in the 11th century, became much more common in the, among the elite by the early 19th century. And what this means is essentially those people had the biggest share of descendants, yeah. because it was their offspring who were in turn the most successful in the competition for mates and the competition for resources, and in, in turn, this translated into to children. At any given point in time, there would, be, there would have been more individuals in these elite niches than could have been sustained. So what this would have led to would have been a, a sort of downward reign of downward social mobility, whereby the surplus offspring gravitated downwards into lower socioeconomic status niches, yeah. which were in turn being vacated by people of formerly lower socioeconomic status until you get all the way down to the bottom, the old peasantry goes extinct. Yeah. The only way down is death, essentially. And you have this downward social mobility of these descendants of these sort of merchant class people, which bootstraps the population, it pulls it up, and this raises the mean IQ, even among people at the bottom who were descended from these merchants from centuries past. And Clark also found that he did analysis in, in an earlier book of wills in Sussex yeah. and in, uh, uh, sorry, in, es in uh, Essex and Suffolk, and he found that if you divide the population between the, based on these wills, and wills were left at, the, at that time by about 40% of, of the male, uh, b b between the richer 50% and the poorer 50%, then the richer 50% had 40% more surviving children complete fertility than the poor of That's a lot. Yeah. And, and if you divide it again, so if you just do, uh, there was another analysis, but I forget the name of uh, some local historian, and he found that if you, if you, if you base it on, uh, forget wills, if you base it on parish records, then the, between rich and poor, you're extending the poor category by doing that, the advantage was 50%. Um, so so as, a, as, a, as, a, as a consequence, what predicts wealth, what predicts how much money you're going to have, yeah. to a certain extent, is intelligence. intelligence. And so there is a and also personality factors. And so these are being um, clearly selected for every generation. And this is why, I mean, we've had all this who do you think you are and all this, this TV program everyone yeah. likes. And what you find if you trace your family tree, even if they were shepherds in the 19th century, once you get back to the 18th or 17th century, they will be quite rich. Right. Because it was only those, they'll be yeoman farmers, as it's called, or, or whatever. Um, because, because only it was those people whose genes survived. Right. Uh, to, to, be, to be descended from a 16th century shepherd would be an extraordinary achievement. Um, <clears throat> now, I, c I can imagine your typical left liberal listener, of, w of which I'm sure this, this podcast has many, many, listening to this, absolutely appalled, and, and they're thinking, it, it was just an accident of birth that all these these uh, rich, powerful people got to be where they are. And you, Thomas Gray explores this in Gray's Elegy. <coughs> you remember where, where he says, um, uh, for many a gem of purest race are, are serene, the dark, unfathomed caves of ocean bear. For many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. What he's suggesting is buried in this, in this village churchyard is all this tremendous potential. It's only by the accident of birth that this talent was, was, was squandered. Well, well, one of the things that Thomas Gray says in that poem is he, talk, he talks about various gravestones in, 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 in the elegy in the churchyard poem. Yes. And, he, talk, and he, he, he talks about beneath this, it's something like beneath this heap the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you have to ask yourself why it is that certain people, um, I indeed certain people who were born shepherds or whatever, um, moved up and were able to afford gravestones by the church or to be buried in the church, and others moved down, down, and, and, and therefore were underneath these heaps of grass. Beneath those rugged elms that yew tree shade, yes. where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap. That's the one. Each in his narrow self revelaid the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. Rude. And, yeah. and um, the, the answers, it, it's not, it is, this idea, if this was accurate, that 
Um, this was a time where there was, it was just totally unfair and everything was a matter of, a, a matter of, of, uh, of privilege and so forth, yeah. then you'd expect that as we alter that, as in the 20th century and 19th century, we, we, we become more concerned about social issues, yeah. you'd expect that the heritability of status across generations would change. And you'd expect that in countries that were more concerned about uh, equality yeah. and so forth, the heritability of social status across number of generations would be different from the heritability of social status um, in, in a country like I know, India, let's say. Where yeah. And that's not true. And there was a, there was a, there was a book uh, by Gregory Clark, again, what was it called? The, 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 uh, the, the Subtle So Right. He, 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 he yes. likes his, uh, his Hemingway puns. Um, and, 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 and he found that across generations from medieval, medieval period to, was it 1950? Or 2000, I forget which. Um, um, the heritability of status across like three generations is the same. It's about 70 percent. Right. So th th it, it, it's not to do with it, it's an element of it's to do with luck, but it's not solely to do with luck. There's some kind of factor behind this. What Clark finds essentially in a, in a nutshell is that status is extremely persistent across <laughs> generations, and although there are these fluctuations and these very, very long trends <coughs> towards downward and more recently upward social mobility because he finds that also using surnames. He finds that in recent years uh, surnames associated with lower status in the 19th century are now more prevalent among elite institutions, among the uh, roles of those enrolled at Oxford and Cambridge, for example, which is one data set he presents in, in The Sun Also Rises. The, the issue really is, is the degree to which when people talk about privilege, are they talking about a wholly socially constructed form of privilege? And if so, I, I, my question to people who believe in these sort of privilege models is this, is to, to what, on what basis should we expect this to be completely divorced from heritable traits? The only sort of privilege I can think of that is truly divorced from heritable traits is, is a lottery win. And Clark shows that among, the dis among people who are, who are winners in the lottery, who win large sums of money, mm. the regression to the mean, essentially, the degree to which those lottery winners lose the money very, right. very quickly and, and revert, essentially, to, to the mean of their group, their yeah. stratum, is very high. The, the status that they acquire, it's a shock, essentially. It's this huge boost in status, but they, 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 they blow through the money, essentially, and right. they, they end up reverting to the status that they had before, or the descendants end up reverting to that status. So we actually have these natural experiments in which we can test pure privilege models, i.e. Where the, where the benefits are allocated on a purely contingent basis with absolutely no, um, with no rhyme or reason. It's just you happen to win this lottery, essentially, and we show it doesn't persist. It does not look like what we see when we look at the patterns of status persistence over time in Clark's data. So why, why have we been going downhill since 1850? Why was 1850 the turning point, roughly? What, what we've argued is that there were two major events. One is that there was a shift in the climate. The climate became milder, essentially. And this was significant because a more mild climate means less of this extrinsic mortality and morbidity to which I alluded earlier. That's true. We, we started coming out of the little, little, little exactly. ice age. We had a yeah. minimum. Yeah. Things got warmer. And this basically led to less ecological stress on these populations, okay, yeah. which translates into less uncontrollable mortality and yeah. morbidity. The benefit of this, however, in terms of who benefited the most from it, was concentrated among those who were previously most vulnerable. Yeah to this uncontrollable morbidity and mortality. And one of the mediators of this, and we have, a, we have another, another uh, a, a monograph, which is an academic treatise, so it's inaccessible, essentially, to, to people without a sort of detailed knowledge of the subject. But one of the things we find as a mediator of this is intergroup competition. Because one of the things that started to happen as climate changed and things started to warm up was groups were no longer as willing to enter into conflict with one another. And this is a very critical thing because it gets us back to the point of genius that Ed brought up earlier. Why, given that they're disagreeable and that they're sort of psychotic and that they're generally unpleasant people to be around, why are they of any benefit at all? The other thing that has been found, by the way, is that historically they had very few children. So who do they bet qui bono, essentially? Who benefits? The answer to that is the group. This is W.D. Hamilton's idea, which we tested and validated, is that 
the main beneficiaries of, of the products of genius are groups of people who benefit from those innovations. And those innovations can be things like cartography, allowing colonial empires to form in South America, so Mercator, people like that, benefited the Portuguese and the Spanish enormously by increasing the reach of those empires, and thus they're indirectly, they boosted their gene copying success. Yes. And when things get warmer, groups are no longer as willing to enter into conflict with one another because resources <coughs> are now more stable. Yeah. And what this means is that essentially, there are no benefits to having these ultra high IQ individuals around. Yeah. So selection shifts away from the group level towards the individual level. And those who are most equipped to benefit from individual level selection are those with lower as opposed to higher general intelligence. Right. And well, then you have a th other factor, which is, which is the Industrial Revolution and what that allowed us to achieve. So before the Industrial Revolution, child mortality is 40% or something, something like that. Um, and this is selecting against the poorest in the society, who are more likely to have, end up with no surviving offspring whatsoever, um, and because they can't provide a, a healthy environment for their children and so forth. Um, and so the children die off, they, they're, they, are, they succumb to childhood diseases, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and so, of course, this is then causing the population IQ to go up generation by generation. Once we have the Industrial Revolution, this starts to change because standards of living are, go up very quickly. We can out, our production level outpaces the rise in population, which means we don't get this traditional system that you used to have of the, of, um, the population rising too high and then there being a famine and it collapsing yeah. down again. The population can, can, can keep going, and as the population keeps going, the level of production can keep going and it can outpace it. And you have these discoveries that are made in medicine, for example, innovations in medicine, innovations in inoculation, uh, all this sort of thing. Contraception. Contracep and I'm going to come to the point, contraception is an area that my colleague is very interested in. Um, a con a con a con and then, of course, contraception. So in, in terms of the inoculations, you have all these children who would have died yeah. And they are now surviving and to have children themselves, yeah. and those children are going to be the children of the, the less well off, and therefore, of, on average, the less intelligent. We also innovate contraception. It's interesting that we, we, we kind of lost the knowledge of contraception in the West because of the, the, the Judaism was, was opposed to it at the point at which Christianity was adopted, um, and, and, and also because we, we became, for other reasons, extremely religious. Um, but we, we, so therefore, in other civilizations, contraception has often been adopted at an earlier stage before the industrial breakthrough, and therefore they start to decline. But in our case, it's adopted after the breakthrough. We, we have contraception, and then who starts to use contraception? Well, it starts off like the reading classes, as it were, start to read about it, and so it's the upper classes, the better off, the more intelligent, who start using it first, um, and and then it trickles down the down the down the society. You have to be intelligent to use contraception properly. I mean, think of how you use something like the pill. Um, do you take it at the exact time every day, which is, uh, not you, but I mean, whatever, uh, who, 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 um, who is, as you're supposed to, or do you knock it back with a glass of red wine before you go to bed? So, uh, and, and these, these, these make significant differences as to whether or not you're going to get pregnant. Now, what this means is that, is that what has happened is there's been this reversal of the traditional pattern. It means that people who are, uh, people tend to have large families, unless they're religious, people tend to have large families as an accident. They have large families because they just, they, they just live in the moment and they decide to have sex and they don't think about the consequences. Right. Or they use contraception, but they use it in a suboptimal way, and so they end up getting pregnant. And people tend to have small, fat, people who are better at planning, that have higher impulse control, that have lower time preference, are able to have the small families they want to have, or indeed not have any family because they're more interested in ideas and intellect and so on, and they don't right. want to have a family. And so the consequence of this then is that intelligence becomes negatively associated um, uh, with how many children you have. In addition, you have the issue of feminism which is also important, which is that, of course, traditionally in the 19th century, there were very few jobs for women. Um, the, the women really didn't work. Okay, or, and if they did work, then once, then once they became, got married, they had to stop work. Um, uh, with, with the rise of feminism, you, of course, find that um, the less intelligent women are less likely to have a career. Um, they, they start having children, very low intelligent women in their teens or whatever. They live for the now, and they are becoming grandparents in their late 30s. So not only are they having more children, they're having more generations. Yes. Um, um, and, and, and in their late 30s, when a lot of highly intelligent women are thinking about becoming parents, those highly intelligent women have dedicated all of their 20s and maybe even the first half of their 30s to their careers. And so, of course, if they have children, then they're only going to have one or two children, if at all. And, of course, they might find that it's too late um, and, and that they, they've, they're past it and they can't. So, so fe feminism is also a factor. in reversing things. And so the consequence is there is now a negative relationship between uh, intelligence and how many And you haven't have. mentioned the other thing, welfare. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Tell us about welfare. 
well that, <laughs> that there, yes. Well, the existence of these social safety nets, which were <coughs> largely Victorian innovation, um, ha is yet another factor that has uh, reduced the level of social hardship and thus extrinsic morbidity and mortality among these populations. So what we're really looking at here is what you could call a sequelae, so a sequence of interconnected factors. You have climatic mildness, you have reduced intergroup competition. All of this coincides with a point in our civilizational history at which we're able to reach a kind of escape velocity with our creative brilliance. We're able to produce the Industrial Revolution. We're able to produce innovations in medicine, contraception. Uh, social innovation such as welfare. All of a sudden we have the ability to produce more wealth to a, to a vastly greater degree than we had in the past, which means people have more disposable income, which of course is something that people can lavish on welfare through higher taxation. And the net effect of all of these, these interconnected selection factors is, as uh, Dr. Dutton said, a uh, re reversal, essentially, of the association between uh, IQ and fertility. But there's more, a more significant point is that this reversal is at the genetic level. The data indicate that those whose genomes are more enriched for genetic variants that we know predict educational attainment and also general intelligence have lower numbers of offspring, the relative lifetime reproductive success is lower. And these associations aren't just phenotypic, they're actually genetic. So those with high levels of cognitive ability are, are, are now genetically predisposed, all else being equal, if you hold everything else constant, to producing fewer offspring. And what that suggests is a very, very strong selection pressure favoring the fertility of those with lower levels of general intelligence. You need a very strong selection pressure to actually create these genetic correlations. Yeah, it's, it's a very observable phenomenon, isn't it, for, for people like us. I, I, I think the reason I haven't got more <coughs> children is not because I don't love children a lot, but because you're thinking, well, how many kids can I, how many boys can I afford to put through Eton? And you think, you're not going to put one through Eton and then another one not, are you? So you, you, you tend to ration yourself, whereas for somebody living on the dole, they get free education, free health care, probably it's in their interest to get extra handouts, so they, they want to breed more. But I'd like to emphasize one, one, one point which I didn't stress, which is the research by Adam Perkins in his book The Welfare Trait. Yes. And, um, and he found that if you divide society into, into three groups of people, those where both parents are working, families where both parents are working, families where one parent is working and not mother's on welfare, and families where both parents are on welfare, it is only the latter group where both parents are on welfare who are procreating at above replacement fertility. I mean, that's how serious it is. Ah. So this is the kind of research that gets people into trouble, isn't it? That 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 I I, I heard earlier from from Ed that 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 you had a couple of university presses turn down your. We didn't name them. Didn't we? Didn't name them. No, we 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 didn't name them. But yes, we we got very far with two. Um, actually, in one instance, the the proposal had made it through review, yeah. and the university in question was preparing a contract. However, oh, sorry. there was an intervention, and the contract never materialized. And that is, uh, that is unfortunately the, uh, the world in which we live. It's, funnily enough, easier to publish <coughs> these sort of things in very, very technical format. So yeah. if you're using a particularly inaccessible and jargonistic language, and you're, you're sort of cloaking the concepts to a certain degree, I, I find that the university the, the university presses and the big presses like Rutledge and Palgrave Macmillan are more receptive. But we were... Well, so long as nobody, nobody's going to read it, that, basically. That's, that's right, <laughs> well, this yes. Is like, it's like with the, uh, under Henry VIII, the idea that, uh, that nobody below the rank of gentlemen should be allowed to own a copy of the Bible in English. You, you can think of this as a sort of hermeneutics. An academic hermeneutics needs to be adopted in order to make these things, these things palatable. Yes, yes. So if I'm this... this Le a le liberal lefty special friend listening to this. Uh, what What is your defense against the charge that you're basically a pair of Nazis? <laughs> well, 
the most straightforward defense against the uh, allegation of there being some kind of nexus between Nazism and IQ research is simply this, and that is that National Socialists in Germany had no time for intelligence research. A lot of people don't realize this, but uh, the National Socialist uh, regime in Germany was its model, it did have sort of anthropological models about how people worked. It was based on a Jungian extension of Jung's archetypes into <coughs> racial types. And they believed that essentially individual differences, which is what we study, yeah. we study the, the factors that cause individuals to vary from one another. That these individual differences are essentially noise, they're nonsense, they're, they're, they're to be ignored. And that what <coughs> you have to do is look at the degree to which individuals conform to a racial type. And in terms of intelligence research, this was disastrous. It actually led to a number of very prominent intelligence researchers fleeing Germany, um, some of which were Jewish and, of course, were therefore objects of, of persecution. Uh, Hans Eysenck being a very good example of this. Um, he and his family had to, leave, had to leave Germany. He was one of the most prominent intelligence researchers in, um, who ever lived. He founded the London School of Differential Psychology. And the the sort of national socialist model was, was completely inimical to the idea of individual differences. Uh, what's more is they didn't believe in intelligence a, as a unitary construct. And our current model of intelligence is based on the idea that there is an overarching general mental ability which predicts performance across a whole bunch of different cognitive domains. And then there are sort of specialized measures of cognitive ability which are domain specific and relate to specific manifestations of, of ability. Uh, but they're all correlated at a very high level. And in Germany, they didn't believe this. They, they believed that intelligence was sort of three different things. There was a sort of a distinctly practical form of intelligence, a distinctly creative form of intelligence. And a distinctly oh, a bit like the left thinks now well, about emotional intelligence. Well, very they, similar they would to... Do because they were very left-wing people. They were national socialists. Yeah. One of the things that they did was they gave medals to women who had particularly high fertility. Now, these medals weren't uh, contingent on them having high IQ and high high fertility, they were simply that they weren't retarded and had high fertility. Yes. So you're dealing with something that would actually reduce. Yes, I, th I, think, I think the sort of basic point is when people make this claim that there's some kind of connection <coughs> there, yeah. they need to demonstrate, certainly to me, because I'm a very empirical person, yeah. that these national socialists or Nazis from whom we allegedly take inspiration. Yeah somehow laid the empirical groundwork for this kind of research. And take, for example, the eugenics movement. The, the eugenics movement, which is not something I endorse, yeah. incidentally, although Ed and I study um, patterns of fertility that affect levels of intelligence over time, this does not entail endorsement of social policy designed to either increase or reduce IQ. Yeah. Um, we, we, we step outside of that, essentially, and we're talking strictly about scientific matters, not political matters. But it's, it's necessary to point out that even something like the eugenics movement, which was really only strongly associated with German National Socialism in the, in the 1960s, mm. um, was not something that was at all strongly associated with German National, so with German National Socialism. It was something that was practiced by a great many progressive yeah. leftist um, sometimes even communists like Hermann Muller, who, who, uh, uh, who um, Hermann Muller, sorry, uh, yes, a famous geneticist Muller, he, he pushed very hard for, uh, for eugenic initiatives. There was a, 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 a document called the uh, Eugenicists Manifesto, it was published in 1938 in Nature. It had the signatories of a great many socialist and communist academics, Dobzhansky, Haldane, Muller, etc. These individuals firmly believe that eugenics was an extension of socialist policy, mm. but it could be used to to engineer better people. Trotsky himself. Well, the raving socialist. Yes, yes no, no. I, George well, I, Bernard Shaw, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky himself was a uh, was 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 a, a proponent of eugenics. Yeah. He wrote an essay on what communism would look like when it came to when it came to America, and he said two major things. One is one is they would utilize eugenics to breed better communists, and yeah. two was nobody would chew gum. Yes. Um, so I'm being distracted by that man talking noisily on his phone. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether it's coming through on the podcast or not. It's bloody annoying, isn't it? Yes. Uh, 
So you, you give me the, the, the literal interpretation of my, of my question. I suppose, to put it in a less specific way, how would you reply to snowflakes who found this whole debate unsettling? Because it isn't what you're ultimately arguing for. I haven't got to the end of your book, by the way, yet. So you can, tum you can, you can sp spoil what happens at the end in a moment. But aren't you really saying we've got to stop the underclass breeding because ultimately we're breeding into our culture more stupidity and this cannot end happily? Isn't that the logical conclusion of your argument? Well, in the book, we try to avoid policy. Right. Because advocating for a given policy <laughs> is, is a sure way to get in trouble. Yes. But there's also another issue here which is quite important, and that is what policy do you prefer? Because ultimately, policy is a matter of preferences. So if, for example, you want to raise the mean IQ of a population, you, A, have to prefer to do that, which indicates yes. a preference of this, which I, I guess could be couched in terms of a preference for sort of the maintenance of civilization. Yes. But you also have to prefer all the baggage that comes along with such initiatives. And what we point out in the book is it's not as easy as simply doing something like gene tinkering. A lot of people say that, well, you can embryo selection, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, germline gene therapy, all of these new whiz-bang technologies mm. that can be used to sort of directly change the genetic drift within the, po the direction or, or of the population. Or lots of modafinil on the NHS. Yes, yeah, so something like that. <laughs> the, the problem is that there's a what we call the context problem, and that is if you look historically, and we alluded to this earlier, populations which were in periods of positive selection for these socially desirable traits, yes. I use the air quote, socially yeah. desirable traits, these populations were also under very heavy group selection. And this colored, to a great extent, the degree to which we as a society desire or do not desire traits. Most of the things we find desirous as a society are traits which benefit groups under <coughs> intergroup competition. So that is what shaped our preferences, essentially. So the groups were under pressure in the past because of things like war and, and, and exactly. famine and stuff. So this is, a, in a way, a consequence of, of, the, of the peace dividend of just We've all got it too good. Pax so Britannica. Yeah, Pax Britannica. Exactly, Brita and Pax Americana. It made things too good, just as Pax Romanus or Romanita made it, too, made it too good for the Romans towards the end of their civilizational cycle also. But the, the issue with regards to group selection is critical because historically the only known mechanism to sustain a regime of selection that actually favors higher levels of intelligence is to have huge intergroup conflict and massive generational wastage. In other words, large numbers of people simply not being able to participate for reasons of mortality in reproduction. And if you're preferring a situation in which you come along and start using gene manipulation, yeah. you have to ask yourself, given the reality of the individual as opposed to group level selection that prevails in modern environments, for better or for worse, and given the idea that we're going to make this into a liberal thing, whereby people can actually choose what their offspring look like based on yes. based on selection for particular genetic variants, etc., do you think people under a regime of individual level selection are going to make socially good choices? For example, what sort of traits do you think make good CEOs? Psychopaths. Exactly. One in five CEOs, according to a recent study, are psychopaths, yes. whereas the frequency of the population for clinical psychopathy is closer to one in a hundred. So women in particular who do most of the choosing, yeah. we know for a fact, prefer extroversion in their offspring. If you give them a hypothetical Yay. scenario and you say to them, what do you want in your kids? If you can control the composition of your children, here's a bunch of traits. They don't choose intelligence. They don't choose conscientiousness. Oh, I see. Right. Yes. They choose extroversion. And extroversion encompasses all of these dominance facets, venturesomeness, all of these more aggressive interpersonal Oh, so you're saying not, they, they choose not good traits. They choose traits which I believe benefit their offspring under individual level selection because women are not stupid. Right. They look around them and they choose the traits which are going to lead to the highest fitness premium in their offspring. If they look around them and they see, they sense they're equipped with specialized evolutionary mechanisms to make these kind of choices, are very sensitive to what are called contextual fitness cues. If they look around them and they see that it's highly extroverted, but not very smart, sort of blackguard type people who, right. are, who are really succeeding, they will choose those traits. I call this process, by the way, runaway artificial selection. 
they want apprentice candidates, don't they? They want their exactly. They so want X factor. So total people, yes. bullshitters, but not actually the the kind of people Fake who are going to gonna devise the the canal system or in, yeah, invent the exactly. spinning jenny. Or so if you give people the ability to do this, I believe that it would lead to disastrous it, it, consequences you would never, for you society. Would, you, would, you would never knowingly select for a highly intelligent autistic child. Exactly. Which is, which is, which is, which is because, because though that child is highly intelligent and creative and so forth, he's bloody difficult to live with. So here I am talking to two chaps who might actually fit on the kind of genius autistic spectrum. You're too kind. Your, your, mothers, your mothers, had they been able to selectively choose your genetics, <laughs> would not have chosen your, your characteristics. So you wouldn't be here. I, I wouldn't have thought so. No. no. Um, the, 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 the certainly, my wouldn't be here. Um, the, the, the um, yeah. I mean, it's 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 this it's this one of the things that we look at, though. One of the questions which um, we were always asked is this idea: of, are, are you making policy and so forth, or, or, or how do you see this in practical terms? But a, a great deal of what people who are interested in science want to, want to know <laughs> um, want to want to want to know about it. It's not it's not a practical issue. You simply want to understand the world. You simply want to look around yeah, and yeah. make sense of what you see. Now you can argue this gives you some kind of advantage in life, perhaps. Mm. But 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 even so, it, it's just an interest. We want to understand something rather than not. I want to understand why you're wearing a jumper with a hole in it, and it makes me it makes me think. And and, and in general, we want to understand things. And so. Whatever the policy is, um, is, is it to a certain degree um, irrelevant? I want to understand, we want to understand what's happening. Um, as far as we can see, there is no easy way for this um, decline in intelligence and consequent decline in civilization um, uh, to be to be addressed. And it's it's happened before. It's definitely happened Cyclical. before. Yes, and this is one tell of me things, about this that. Is one of the, well, this is one of the things that we, we, look, we look at in our book. We look, we, we, we look at other civilizations and how they've fared. And what you find um, again and again and again is that there isn't this idea, this idea that we're perhaps raised with in a, in a Christian culture of getting better and better and better and ultimately getting to heaven, the, the linear model. Yeah. Um, and, and equally, the model that you have in the 16th century, which is the model that our best days are behind us, so let's, you know, Shakespeare and so on, let's imitate Rome, let's take everything that's been done in the past yeah. and just imitate that because we can never get back to that again. Um, that The Garden of Eden model or whatever, um, that, that, that's not true. But what you find again and again is a cyclical model. Mm. That civilizations will start, they will start under conditions of intense selection, um, under conditions where it's very... It, 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 it's under great harsh, pressure from outside enemies. Under great pressure, enemies. extrinsic pressure um, from outside, and um, because of that pressure, they will tend to develop and, and, they, will, and they will become essentially more and more intelligent. Um, that process that we've seen before. Um, we actually charted that, didn't we? Which one was it with? With, with the per, per capita innovations, there was that American physicist who charted per capita innovations. Yeah. In a, John, in a Jonathan period. Hubner, who has... Uh, <coughs> he's one of a number of researchers who has looked at the... Uh, the cycles of time that you see in major innovations. So what we mean by major innovations are things like the Concorde yeah. and the various breakthroughs that went into constructing that particular <coughs> aircraft. What we don't mean are things like the iPhone 2, the iPhone 3, the yes. iPhone 4, etc. These are micro innovations and they're quite important in their own right. But these are not the sort of breakthrough innovations on which civilization turns. They, they, don't, yeah. they don't function as any kind of fulcrum point essentially for civilization. Yeah. And as, as, as Dr. Dutton mentioned earlier, you can map the cyclicity in these innovations by simply looking at the degree to which independent historians of science and technology agree with one another as to what and who constitutes a major innovation or major innovator. So you can take the correlation among these different historians in terms of their ranking of the, the, the yes. prominence of these innovations, and you find they all agree with each other, and there's a high inter-rate of reliability, as we call it, which suggests that these ratings are not just subjective taste okay. related preferences. They're objective in the sense that there's an objective reality and these people are all independently, independently arriving at the same conclusion. And what do they tell us? I, I well, what they tell us is essentially in the West, the uh, innovation rates peaked in the 18, uh, 1850s to 1870s. And it's declined to the point where today the per capita innovation rate is four per year per billion of the world's population. In the middle of the 19th century, it was 16 per year per billion of the world's population. Oh, my God. And we're a quarter of what we were then. Yeah, that's right. And what's worse is the last time we were at four per year per billion yeah. was in the 1600s when we had a fraction of the population that we do today. Right. So this means despite the growth in population, which calls back to the 
point you raised earlier. And despite the increase in the prevalence of education, so now everybody's educated, yeah. which back then it would have been an extraordinarily rarefied fraction of the population, despite this, the innovation rates have reached parity, which is astonishing. And if you think as well of, of the behaviour patterns of people in 1650 or whatever, um, they're going to be more religious or more violent or whatever because they're under a great deal of stress. They're under a great deal of stress um, and so this is going to push their behaviour in a certain direction. Now with us, this is, this is, um, you know, this is lessened uh, by our, our, our luxury, by the fact we're not under that stress. So imagine what would happen if things were to go wrong yeah. now. If we were Economic collapse. Uh, yeah, if, if, uh, we're back. At, we're at the level of people that would hang, draw, and quarter traitors. Yes. Well, d uh, well, not quite, because we have. Sixteen fifty. Well, so. life history has slowed. Oh. But that's a whole other conversation. So some of, some aspects of our personality are very different from how we were in the 1650s, which might buffer against oh, yes, this idea that we'd revert to a sort of barbarism. But these aspects of personality are associated with the ability to specialize. And this relates to a question that your special listener friend, who is doubtless very highly intelligent, Mensa, super. Oxbridge, Ivy League educated, super highly intelligent, they're going to have a question. And that is what about the Flynn effect? And the Flynn effect, of course, is this increase in IQ, measured IQ, <coughs> of around three IQ points per decade. And they're going to say, well, hang on, we've heard about this thing called the Flynn effect. IQ is going up. How can these academics claim yes. that we're getting dumber? Yes, how can you? So how, so, and this is a very interesting question. Because back in the 1930s, there was a chap called Raymond B. Cattell. He was a British psychometrician. He was terribly worried about these IQ decline trends that we're talking about. And he wrote a book called The Fight for Our National Intelligence. And it was a sort of cri de guerre um, attempting to rally people around this idea that there was this general dysgenic trend and, and that we should all be terribly worried about it and we should re-engineer our policy in some way to fix it. So he was a eugenicist. And he actually was a man of conviction. So he thought, well, I'll give it two decades and then I'll revisit the topic and I'll look at the IQs of people in two decades' time and I will see if they have lower IQ, which they should have given the dysgenic fertility gradients. He actually found the opposite. He found they had higher IQ. So over the course of two decades, in two populations, which were sampled from the same sort of people, i.e. young people, essentially, and measured using the same IQ test, there had been an increase of about two or three IQ points. And this was confirmed by other researchers as well. And in the 1960s, it was rather embarrassingly called Cattell's Paradox, because nobody could square this contradiction with the observations. We, we know that there have been negative correlations between fertility and IQ, yet IQ is rising. So what's going on? Yes. Well, essentially, this is an innovation that I must admit I have to take credit for, because I, I, I was the first person to propose this, this solution to Cattell's paradox, and that is based on the idea that, as we mentioned earlier, intelligence is not a uniform thing. When people are measured on IQ, it measures, it measures two kinds of things. One is a general mental ability, mm. which is highly heritable and is very central to how people perform in terms of generally being able to solve complex problems or abstract problems. But there are also these specialized manifestations of intelligence, these narrow or what are called group factors. And these below those are these sort of even narrower factors that influence your, your performance on a specific IQ test. Like uh, maybe you had test anxiety because you're particularly intimidated by visuospatial type problems, mm. but you're perfectly fine with verbal type problems. So the anxiety on the visual-spatial condition will maybe push your IQ down on that one test a little bit more than would be the case. Um, otherwise. So these are what we call group uh, 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 narrow, narrow factors. So what it, it turns out that this selection pressure is acting exclusively on this general intelligence. But because IQ tests measure a mixture of general and specific cognitive ability, when you look at people's overall performance on IQ tests, there is an increase. This is because the increase is concentrated on those specialized abilities. And those specialized abilities have very low heritability. The degree to which they're influenced by variation in genetic factors is quite low. 
In other words, the degree to which they're influenced by environmental factors, such as exposure to education, yep. improvements mm -hmm. in nutrition, getting rid of lead from the environment, for example, yes. all of these things, in as much as they affect IQ, and they do affect IQ, affect IQ at the level of these specialized abilities. So give me an example of these specialized abilities. Well, one example would be um, short-term memory. So short-term memory is the ability to, the ability to, to uh, remember bits of information. Yep. And people today, because they have to remember telephone numbers and they have to remember addresses and they have to remember URLs and internet passwords, etc., because they have to memorize all these things, have better short-term memory than they did, say, 50 years ago. Yeah. So people's short-term memory has definitely improved. People can remember more bits of information. And short-term memory is not particularly G-loaded, by which I mean it doesn't correlate with this general factor yeah. of intelligence very well. And actually, in modern populations, it correlates less well than it might have done historically. So if one were able to strip out the specialized skills... Exactly. Then, then suddenly you would, f you would find that this drop in intelligence would show. And that's exactly what we, what we have found. Over the last 10 years, I and various of my colleagues, such as Dr. Dutton and others, have looked at specific measures of ability that we think of as being very pure or invariant measures of general intelligence. Yep. These include reaction times, working memory as opposed to short-term memory, um, the, uh, the ability mm. to use certain items of vocabulary where the items themselves have a known degree of difficulty in terms of utilization, using them correctly or learning them. And we've shown that across the board, and macro innovations, these great breakthrough innovations, these things seem to be pretty pure measures of this underlying general intelligence. Yep. Because unlike full-scale IQ, which is contaminated by the Flynn effect, these things, when you look at when you map them out over time, have shown very long-term declines. Is it not also the case that you look at the kind of O-level maths paper that people were sitting in, say, 1950, and you compare it with the, the GCSE equivalent now, the, and, and you apply it to across the board, the, the, the standard of, of paper. I've, I've got a book in my downstairs loo of a, uh, to prepare children at prep schools for their, um, their common entrance exam. And it's, the knowledge that it ex is expected of them is pitched way above what, what kids are expected to know now. Well, if you just look at a children's book like Just William, and the, the, the idea that a child of, of eight or something like that would, would, would be able to read that now with, with, with words like, you know, uh, querulously and, 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 and whatever, is, 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 is yeah, it's, the standard has gone down. Now, now. Yeah. The key point is that the IQ test is not a perfect measure of intelligence right. any more than a, a scales is a perfect measure of weight. And what makes this is another thing that your, your left listener will say. He'll say, oh, well, the IQ test is just it's only measuring IQ. Yeah. Well, we know that's not true. It, 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 uh, it, has, it, it measures specific things and it measures them well. So it, it measures important things. It measures things like how much money you earn or how educated you are, whatever. It predicts those things. Uh, um, and, and, and secondly, different measures of cognitive ability um, go in the same direction as the IQ test. So, for example, you, you, you might how well you do at GCSE, let's say. That's a good measure of cognitive ability. But that correlates, that's predicted by about 70%. So, so, so it, it, you know, this is this is genuinely measuring intelligence, yeah. but it's not a perfect measure of it. It's also measuring this this noise, if you like, these these other factors which are weakly correlated with intelligence, right? Like like uh, working memory, or or with the Flynn effect, we're, we're talking about the, the ability to um, in, engage in a sort of it, it's it, it's a, a subject called similarities that the Flynn effect is on. So it's it's the ability to compartmentalize and to show the connections between different. Um, different phenomena, right? That's that's what the Flynn effect is about. Uh, that's the part of the test on similarities, and um, it, it, it's that that's going up. We're getting better at that, right. and we're getting better at that because we're living in this increasingly scientific environment, where which is which is everybody can read. Everybody is basically um, compelled to think in what we might call an analytical way. And that wasn't the case in the past. Jim Flynn, uh, in, in his book, Are We Getting Smarter, looks at the Russian peasants circa sort of 1900, and he's trying to ask them questions, which would be the kind of questions you get on an IQ test, you know, what's the relationship between this and this? And they, they can't do that. They don't think like that. They think in a practical way, not an abstract yeah. way. Yeah, there's, a good, there's a good example of a question. The, the chap was called Luria. He was a psychologist in the Soviet Union right when Stalin was rising to power. And one of the things he did was he asked peasants in Siberia, uh, if 
it was an example involving polar bears or, or, or bears. He said, if, if uh, not all bears are white, mm. sorry, no, that's, that's, that's <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. It's a good example. We, we have to give it to you. The, so. the, okay, well, we'll find the, the bear example. Let me ask you, um, you haven't made any policy prescriptions for obvious reasons, but tell me, first of all, if we are all getting thicker, why should we worry about this? What, what, are, the, what, are, the, what are the danger signs we should look out for, and well where are we going to go? You would, I mean, with, with the example of Concord, um, you, w it, w it will be a slow process, but you will expect to notice over many years lots more little things going wrong that's the start so society will start to work less well yeah um but also if you look at all of there are we in our book we have a table where we look at all of the many correlates of intelligence um so for example corruption so you would expect levels of corruption to increase because criminality is is negatively associated with intelligence time preference is negatively you you, you you've got to have a you, you live for the now yeah so you won't see into the future and perceive the problem of, of creating a corrupt society politically people who are of low intelligence tend to be totalitarian they, they, they they're not particularly into democracy they don't have these kind of community values these burger values if you like which are, which, are, which are the essence of, of sort of traditional liberalism. So the democracy will start to decline and will become debased. You'll notice that. Um, you'll know it, things will it, things won't, will, won't, won't be working as well. Things that you used to be able to do, you'll find you can't do anymore. Little things won't get fixed. Um, Cattell suggested that we've become increasingly interested in sex as well, mm. which is which, which is interesting because if it, because intelligence is associated with this kind of short-term way of of, of 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 living in the world and superficial way of living in the world. So we'll be less interested in intellectual things, more interested in sex and sort of baser pleasures. You'd expect the, the nature of music to change uh, because that's is, is the kind of music you like is predicted by intelligence instead of like more complex sort of music, classical music, whatever. Um, you'd expect the nature of art to change. Everything in society would gradually change to reflect what a less intelligent person would be interested in. This, this specifically pertains to general intelligence, so right. the idea that, that there's a kind of a... <coughs> a network of, of, of real-world manifestations of this highly overarching and domain general intelligence. But I, I think we ought to stress that we are not denigrating the Flynn effect here either, mm. because the Flynn effect is a real phenomenon, and in a sense it does reflect a genuine gain in certain cognitive competencies. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're very narrow. They're not general. And while there are certain things that might relate strongly to general intelligence that will decline, the Flynn effect has caused certain things that relate to the proliferation of specialized cognitive ability, abilities and skills to increase. <coughs> a very good example of this is GDP per capita. A lot of the growth in GDP per capita is driven by comparative advantage. So in other words, the, the, the idea that, that, uh, that there are advantages to having high levels of specialization um, high levels of uh, differentiation in terms of labor and the advantage that that gives one group relative to another and one individual relative to another. And this process is, is, is actually quite important in, in as much as it masks many of the trends yes. that we think ought to be happening given the reality of declining general intelligence because it does look and the, the, the sort of these, these optimists like Steven Pinker for example yeah. point out, they've written, you know, Stephen Pinker has written a whole book about this um, entitled Enlightenment Now! Exclamation point. And in this book, he, he basically completely brushes aside any concerns about dysgenics. He mentions one of my papers, but it's sort of very dismissively. And he focuses on all of these positive social trends, decrease in violence, increase in, in GDP, increase in certain aspects of mental health and, and well-being. It's not reckoned to be his, because I've read a few Pinkers, and I think the new one is not reckoned to be his best, is it? It's, I, th I, think think it's, it's, I think it's, it's his worst. Rather like someone, like someone, rather, rather like someone at school, you can, you can do well in school, in let's say your GCSEs, because you're highly oh. intelligent. Or, you, or, or up to a point, you can do well if you have a certain kind of personality, if you're very high, what they call conscientious, yeah, very yeah. high impulse control, but only up to a point. So your lack of... Um, intelligence can be masked by your conscientiousness up to a point. But beyond a certain point, if your intelligence isn't very high, you, you won't be able to go. 
And it's much the same with society. Up to a point, if we are increasing in something like conscientiousness, in something like a different, this, this parallel way of thinking, it can mask the decline up to a point, but eventually that turn, it will not be able to do so anymore. And that's what's happened on IQ tests, certainly. So we, we, it, up to about 1997, IQ was increasing. And then we, found, we started to find that in Finland and in Scandinavian countries where they have compulsory military service, and therefore they have year on year, yep. basically the whole male cohort, that turning point was reached sans immigration or any other factor that might interfere with it because the, the levels of immigration are so low in those countries, um, in about 1997. And then the IQ scores start to go down, start to go down, start to go down, year on year. And what had happened is that that specialised ability that Margaret was talking about earlier, this ability to think in this highly abstract way... Well, it's abilities, plural. Plural, abilities, yeah. plural, yes, these specialised abilities, um, had reached their limit, their, you know, and, and uh, the, the limit to which the environment could, could impact them. And therefore, the genetic decline um, started. To, Michael calls it the co-occurrence model. Um, um, started started to, you know, to poke through the fact that this parallel decline was happening as something was rising. And even on even on the thin, even even on the thin effect, then we start to we start to see it. And this is what will happen in society. There will there will we, we will continue with these micro innovations, but there will be a limit. What whence the underlying decline in G will start to definitely poke through. Yes. And given that the, the main goal of our culture seems to be the creation of equality, how are we going to... Th there's not going to be the appetite, is there, for people to change that? Because people are going to say, well, intelligence is overrated anyway, and actually, you know, it's good that, it's good that working people are finally sort of mixing it up with the clever people and we're all regressing to the mean. Uh, do you not think? Uh, isn't that isn't that that where our culture is going? That that we we kind of celebrate our own stupidity. Well, we could draw a distinction between different forms or strains of egalitarianism, uh, which roughly dichotomize along the lines of the so-called old versus the new left. So, you could look at the old left. As I mentioned earlier, the the old left were very much in favour of eugenics, and they were at the forefront in the 1920s and 30s of pushing for eugenic initiatives. We're talking about Davenport, H.G. Wells, George Bernard Shaw, Dobzhansky, Muller, et cetera, et cetera. There were a great number of uh, progressive thinkers. Galton himself would have been on the progressive side yeah. of the spectrum. Darwin also was someone who believed very firmly in policy geared towards creating equality. He was a firm abolitionist. He was also someone who was inordinately concerned with what he called the, uh, the, the procreation of, he unflatteringly referred to them as scum, um, yeah, and, and he was very concerned about dysgenic trends. And that's the old left. Right. The new left took on an entirely different mindset. The new left make as, have, have as their focal point, essentially ideologically, this concept of value-neutral liberalism. So this is based on a very highly relativist idea that all decisions made by individuals are equal in terms of virtue, equal in terms of value, that there is no privileged frame of reference from which one can say that this sort of decision or this sort of value system is uh, better than that sort of system or that sort of value system. And in as much as older value systems, which have traveled across time due to a sort of historical inertia, yeah are inimical to the fervence of these liberal yep. goals and the, the, the promotion of greater value neutrality, they are to be opposed and critiqued. And this is, this is based on the idea that all of these value systems are ultimately socially constructed. Yes. And that they all exist within a space of, of, of sort of competing meta-narratives. And this is why the New Left really don't like, well, not all of them, I'm unfairly homogenizing them as a group, this is why certainly the most influential among the new left and also certain individuals on the right as well, or certain strains of rightist thinking as well which are inimical to this. This is why they don't like this idea that there are these innate factors that dictate which set of traditions propagate across time or which set of people propagate across time yes. in terms of who enjoys the greatest fitness dividend over time. They, they don't like this because that implies an obstacle or barrier to 
to the, the, the idea that you can simply remake the world by, by adopting an essentially liberal value frame. And this is where the resistance comes from. They, 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 they impute bad motives to people who are... Like you two. Exactly. Yeah. They call us all sorts of terrible names. And they impute bad motives to people like uh, Dr. Dutton and myself when, as Dr. Dutton said, what we're primarily interested in is unearthing facts. What's happening? And that's another point, which is, I mean, there was, a, there was an Islamic scholar in the 12th century, or th I think 13th century, called Ibn Khaldun. And, and he had this, uh, he was the first person to really articulate this model of the cycle of civilization. Yeah. And what he argued was that civilizations start off in, under conditions of basically very harsh selection, desert tribesmen, and they have a strong level of what he called asabiyah, which is basically a sort of combination, sort of, sort of social solidarity, something like that. Um, and, and eventually they're so intelligent they start to innovate cities, they build these cities, the cities become luxurious, Asabiyar declines. Asabiyar declines because selection has declined in part, they are no longer under these harsh conditions. As a consequence, the other, further desert tribes can come, uh, the enemy at the gate as it were, they are higher in Asabiyar, they invade, they take over, and then the process begins all over again. And one of the things that we think is relevant in the book is this idea that what can we do about it, or what's your policy, or whatever it is, we just want to observe what's happening. And what seems to be happening, it may well be simply a truth of the nature of how humans operate in evolutionary terms. Yes. That there has to be, that, 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 that we are under conditions of harsh selection, we, therefore we are selected for intelligence, therefore we, we, we uh, develop and develop and develop. Um, we reach a sort of turning point, and at that turning point, level of luxury among the upper class is relatively high. Um, they start to use contraception. Um, they uh, start to take control of their lives. They start to realize it's not just the gods that cause everything. It's their own decisions that cause things. They start to limit their own fertility. Um, and consequently, with, with these contraception, they and consequently, um, in intelligence starts to go down and the civilization um, uh, collapses. And it could be um, that the reason, there's a colleague of ours called Gerhard Meisenberg who kind of articulated this idea, that the, what it is with us, why we've gone further. Um, is, is because we inherited this Jewish uh, abhorrence of contraception uh, at the point at which we adopted Christianity and because we were very, very, very religious. We became very religious for various reasons that there's no, no reason to go into now, but we became very, very religious and therefore it took us longer before we started. We, we were at a higher level of luxury, as it were, before we started to questioning religiousness using contraception. Therefore, we got beyond. We made the breakthrough of the Industrial Revolution. But unfortunately, we will collapse because that's what civilizations do. Do, yes. I was wondering about that. I was wondering whether that we have within us this kind of cultural suicide gene and that this, this impulse you're seeing across academia increasingly <coughs> This, this cultural relativism, if you like, this refusal it, to acknowledge the fact. It has to happen, because if it, if it, if it didn't happen, yeah. if there wasn't the collapse in civilization, we wouldn't return to, um, uh, to, to pre-industrial levels of selection. So basically, everything would become so luxurious that nobody would have children, and we'd just die out. So in order for humanity, I think, to survive, there has to be a point at which we, you know, you know what do you think? Well, I think the, the, the issue is not so much about species survival per se, it's more about the fact that there is no privileged direction in selection. If you want an example of something that's truly relative, where there is no ought type statement about how things ought to be, it is natural selection or genetic selection, because really you're talking about social selection, sexual selection, natural selection, etc. At the moment, things are looking pretty good for people with low average intelligence in terms of fertility. They are doing Darwin's will. They are doing exactly as Darwin commands them to do. Yeah. He, commands his, he commands his creations to go forth and multiply. Yeah. And that is exactly what, uh, what they are doing. The people who are failing Darwin's, who are failing to, to, to execute Darwin's will, are those with high levels of intelligence. So in terms of selection, Things are absolutely fine for people with low intelligence. Yeah. Just as they might be absolutely fine for moths with a certain kind of vaniculation on their wings, which gives rise to a certain degree of camouflage when they land on a particular tree and they blend in with a particular pattern of lichen. This is Kettlewell's experiments with, uh, with the Biston blechularia, the peppered moth. Um, there's no, there's no ought about whether these moths ought to survive or not. Yes. So because selection has no preferred or intrinsic directionality, um, we, 
we shouldn't really read any kind of um, teleology or value into, we shouldn't take any kind of moral uh, stance on, on the direction of things. Mm. As, as Dr. Dutton said, this is simply the way things are, the way things unfold in nature. Whatever is conducive to fitness leads to more procreation. If our future is a lower IQ future in which people have less intelligence and correspondingly less complex civilizations, but this means that there's increased gene copying success, then that is what's going to happen. Yes. Do you, apart from the issue with your publishers, do you anticipate getting any grief over this book from academe or beyond? <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question. Now, so far, I haven't personally had any grief over this, although your special listening friend may uh, may choose to give me grief over this. I doubt it. Not, no, our special <laughs> friend is actually rather lovely, I think you'll find. That would be... If they have lovely things to say about yeah. it, then that would be but, excellent. But I you think if they wanted to give us serious grief, they'd given us serious grief by now. I mean, they perhaps have done. I mean, this is not, in, in, in sense of what you could write about, this controversial. Yeah, there's a sense also in which this topic of civilizational decline is more safe now to talk about than might have been the case in the past. For example, Stephen Pinker put out his pathologically optimistic take on our future um, in his book Enlightenment Now. And I noticed one thing that was very interesting was the amount of flack that the book got from leftists, funnily enough, who said, how can he say these things when we're in a world full of racism and sexism and microaggressions, etc., etc." So there's a certain mindset out there which, which may or may not correlate to a degree with the left, which includes, but is not limited to, also this issue of global warming yeah. being a, a sort of general catastrophe. This is another point, but though. I think increasingly people are realizing that what a lot of the mainstream media are telling them is, is, uh, yes. is, is a but pack of lies, and so therefore they're open for people to challenge that. Yes. This makes certain people, even certain people on the left, I think more open to these more what you could call pessimistic or declinist narratives on civilization. And this may make them more open even to thinking about these things in terms which they're not <coughs> used to based on their... I love the idea that you're drawing optimism from declinism, from the spread of declinism. That's a kind of paradox, isn't it? Well, it, 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 is, a, it is an interesting paradox, but it, it's also a sign of the times. Because it does seem to be the case that, and this is something that's been noted by other sociologists, they have looked at levels of optimism among people living today, versus people historically, people today generally are more pessimistic about the state of civilization. And that pessimism prospects. is our friend. Well, the pessimism is, is, is useful in the sense that it might make them more open to a larger right. set of declinist ideas. Um, but we, we have definitely found that, that, there are, that there is a certain audience for this, and it's not necessarily sort of right, you know, right of center type people either. Right. I mean, I was doing most, most of the work trying to get this book published. And I found again and again and again that the commissioning editors were absolutely fascinated by mm. this. And indeed, book potential book reviewers potentially well up for yes. this. But, but the, the powers that be... Has anyone reviewed it, even? Well, there was someone that wanted to... Can I say this? There was someone that wanted to review it for a certain very important newspaper. Should we, should we I say think it? we ought to keep the name out we'll of keep this. The name out of it. mention the newspaper. Uh, well, wait, sorry, let me mention his name. Yeah. No, mention, what, what's the newspaper? Yes, mention Sunday the Times. And, and this and, and this uh, this uh, reviewer was well up. He really he contacted us and he said, "I'd like to review your book for Sunday Times." And he wrote, I think he wrote the review, and then the editor said, <laughs> "I'm not writing this." Oh one. my goodness! Yes, we did have. That is shame on you, Sunday Times editor. Yes, it was, it was terrible. That's we, really lightweight. We have found this also with the Daily Mail as no. well. There's there's far. It used to be the case that both Dr. Dutton and myself had a great deal of success getting a lot of we actually fairly good quality. This Comments. is classic old mail yes. story. Yeah. And the new mail with its whatever is running it um, is, uh, is, is basically utterly hostile. I would like to continue this conversation because I think my special friend is sitting there gobsmacked and, and, and loving you both. But actually, we've this is actually the longest ever. Well, I say it's the longest first. ever. It's the first, so it's, the <laughs> it's setting new standards. People actually have said, I wish the Delling Pole podcast were longer. And here we have the Delling Pole, Delling Pod, which is really long. 
and um, we'll see how it goes down. But I could continue this conversation for hours, and maybe we'll we can reconvene, can't we, to do another one? I mean, it's got, I don't know when you're next over from Summer. Finland, 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 the country where I want to be, apparently trekking or camping or simply watching, watching TV. TV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it would be good. Right here. It's a date. Good. Absolutely. All right then. Well, um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, you're listening to the Delling Pod with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guests, Michael Woodley and Ed Dutton. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Uh,